Okay. Good morning. Uh, I'm Dr. Tom Wood. I am the epidemiologist with Samaritan's Purse. Uh, Part-time off-site right now, so I'm broadcasting or we're coming to you or I'm coming to you uh, through the amazing uh, new world of electronics from Austin, Texas, where uh, we live. My wife and I live just north, uh, west of Austin, overlooking Lake Travis, which is at flood stage right now. As you've heard here in Texas, we've got a lot of flooding going on. So. Um, I wanted to this morning welcome you uh, and uh, for joining us and uh, want to take the time today that uh, to t encourage you that are listening out there that uh, if you'll look over on the right hand side of your screen you'll see a ch group chat box uh, with a place at the bottom to enter uh, questions or comments that you may have during our presentation today and we would encourage you to do that. I will as, act as the moderator for those uh, with our speaker and uh, who I'll introduce in just a second to you. Uh, but I'll moderate those questions and at appropriate times when I can either insert them or at the end of his presentation, of the presentation, uh, you know, I will be able to, uh, to uh, you know, to, to get those uh, to uh, our, our speaker. Our speaker today, and we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Phil Fisher with us. Uh, Dr. Fisher uh, attended medical school at the University of California in Irvine, uh, a fine school as I know, uh, being from that por portion of the country. Uh, he completed his pediatric residency at the University of Utah and has also studied at the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine uh, before he went to work in Central Africa from 1985 to, 1981, to 1991. Dr. Fisher is currently a professor of pediatrics at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Also know that area because I have a great friend who lives there. He and his wife, uh, Julie, uh, have five grown children, each of whom received, it says, good childhood nutrition in Africa. I'm sure being Dr. Ch uh, Fisher's children, they did. Uh, while Dr. Fisher was trying to figure out how to help malnourished children in that area. Uh, so with that, uh, Dr. Fisher, I'm going to turn this over to you and uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom, and thanks to each of you that's joined us today. I know it's lunchtime for some of you, and you're probably enjoying some nice, tasty food while we're going to talk about malnutrition. And indeed, malnutrition is a big deal for the people of the world. If we just look at a few key facts, we recognize that more than a billion people on our planet lack adequate food. About 3 million children die each year, and the next slide gives some of these details. About 3 million children die each year with malnutrition contributing to their deaths. A fourth of children in developing countries are underweight, and half the children of the developing countries of the world are deficient in micronutrients. So malnutrition is a big deal. We have some objectives for today. We'll try to talk about some different classifications of malnutrition. We'll talk about the biochemical changes that occur with malnutrition. And then we'll talk about current diagnostic criteria and focus mostly on tested effective approaches to the management of acute severe malnutrition. So we'll be looking at kids that are sick. This map here gives us an idea of places where children are dying. Ideally, people would be born and live to a ripe old age, but the redder the areas of this map are the areas where more children are dying. And some of you will recognize places you live and places you work there. And indeed, most of these deaths have malnutrition as a significant contribution. As the next slide shows us, approximately 45% of all pediatric deaths are associated with malnutrition. 70% of the malnourished children in the world are located in seven specific countries. So the next slide gives a list of some of those countries. And in fact, those are countries where I hang out for the most part, where many of you hang out, and where we have friends that are working. Malnutrition is a big deal and it's an important problem for many children of the world. It's still killing kids and contributing to the deaths of children. But I have a personal confession to make. As a pediatrician, I must admit that I struggle more with malnutrition than with any other pediatric problem. 
This has been a problem since my training days and it's still a problem. I went to Nigeria as a medical student in 1980 thinking I knew something about malnutrition and that I needed to have feasible ideas of treatment. And yet what I offered wasn't always feasible for people. I worked, as Tom mentioned, for six years in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and during that time we saw lots of malnourished children, and we tried to help manage those children. Uh, this next slide shows where we were. There's some Samaritan's Purse people working in that site in Niankundi in the Democratic Republic of Congo. We had malnourished children, we set up a feeding place, and we still had limited results. I remember one child that was sitting on the mother's lap, malnourished, being given food, received the food, looked up at the mother, and then dropped dead. Children continued to die of malnutrition. Since I've been based in the States, traveling around the world, I've continued to struggle with malnutrition, and I've come to realize that there is no easy solution. It's not like having a person blowing a pipe and making a snake stand up and dance, because we're not snake charmers. Malnutrition is a complicated situation, and it would be nice, as this next slide shows, we could just blow on our flute and children would get better, but in fact, it's not magical. I've also realized as I travel that malnutrition is sometimes related to conflict. I took this picture as I looked across during ward rounds in a hospital in Africa a few years ago because I thought it was a nice view of a surgeon father with his surgeon son that were visiting. And it wasn't until I looked back at the picture I realized that the picture also showed what uh, conflict, as exemplified by the armed guard during rounds, conflict contributes to social unrest and to many of the problems that lead to malnutrition. So a few years ago in 2010, I was asked to help edit a book for the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, and I thought, this will be good. I'm going to find somebody that really knows something that can write the malnutrition chapter of the book. But everybody that seemed like an expert was unavailable or unwilling to write the chapter, and I was left trying to write the chapter myself. Fortunately, even at that time, there were resources. The World Health Organization in 2003 had some guidelines for the treatment of children. Updated since then, there's a book from the World Health Organization about the hospital care for children. And there are other resources that have come out since then, as the article highlighted on the next slide points out, um, that we can manage severe acute malnutrition even in low-income countries. But I still wanted somebody to help write the chapter, and I found during an Africa visit that there was actually a place where they were providing good care and where children were getting good care for malnutrition. So I recruited the author uh, as an author, one of the people working at that hospital. The chapter ended up helping a lot of people, and now as the next slide shows, a second edition of the book has come out with an even better malnutrition chapter to help guide what we do. So malnutrition is a big problem. It's a hard problem to deal with because it's common and it's complicated, but there are time-tested ways now that we can suggest. So when we talk about malnutrition, we could talk about a lot of things. We could talk about overnutrition, which some of us suffer from, and many of our patients in some parts of the world are overnourished. We could talk about undernutrition, either mild, moderate, or severe. We can talk about people that aren't as tall as they should be, stunting. We can talk about people that don't weigh as much as they should for their height, wasted or wasting children. But we're going to focus today mostly on what we call generalized or protein energy malnutrition. We typically divide this into two types, marasmus and kwashiorkor. We need to realize that protein energy malnutrition is actually a malnutrition that results in wasting, but sometimes not in weight loss because there can be edema. So when we talk about severe acute malnutrition, we're talking about severe undernutrition with wasting and sometimes with peripheral swelling, peripheral edema. The two types of severe malnutrition are depicted in this next slide showing marasmus and kwashiorkor. The children with marasmus typically look very thin but still have a good appetite and a normal head of hair. They've lost some of their subcutaneous fat in their cheeks, which gives them what some call the little old man appearance, and they have wasted muscles and are missing fat through the rest of their body. That's distinct from the children with kwashiorkor. 
Quashiorcor kids look apathetic, don't have much appetite. They have flaky, pale, fragile hair. They have skin rashes where their skin is sloughing or desquamating. And they have low levels of protein in their blood, leading them to have pitting edema in their peripheral extremities. Marasmus and Quashiorcor are the two main parts or types of malnutrition. Uh, so marasmus is a severe, not sever, a severe muscle wasting that comes as a healthy response to deprivation of protein, carbohydrate, and essential nutrition, nu nutrients. So marasmus is the normal or adaptive response. Quashiorcor, on the other hand, is a maladaptive response to deprivation. Children maintain some fat, but they have a lot of other biochemical changes that lead them to trouble. So if we want to really understand malnutrition, we have to understand that it's a metabolic disorder. It's not just a lack of food, but it's often a maladaptive response um, or even with a reactive response to undernutrition where children have altered metabolism. It's not just a lack of quantity of food, but it's also from the lack of adequate quality of food. We know that poverty is not easily cured just by giving money. Similarly, malnutrition is not easily cured just by giving food. For in fact, I apologize, I just see there's another typo on this slide, but in fact there are metabolic derangements where some electrolyte levels go down, potassium and magnesium, uh, the concentration of sodium often goes up, immunity is impaired, intestinal tracts don't absorb well, kidneys don't work well, the heart doesn't work as well, blood glucose metabolism is altered, and people respond differently to different medical interventions. So malnutrition is not just a lack of food, but in fact malnutrition is a metabolic derangement in response to not having had adequate food. The diagnosis of malnutrition is sometimes easy if we look at the child and see how thin the child is. Children that come to us bundled with clothes without the nasogastric tube in place might not look quite so starved when we first see them. We like to make a holistic diagnosis as we look at the whole child. We'll sometimes see the signs of macronutrient deficiency, protein calorie malnutrition. Sometimes we'll find signs of specific micronutrient deficiencies, vitamin A, iron, for instance, and some of these children will have developmental delays or even regression in development because of their malnutrition. But the key to diagnosing malnutrition comes from seeing how a child has been growing. Growth curves have changed in most of the world in the past decade, so we've replaced the earlier standards, so we now have a growth curve that's more representative of growth of children scattered around the world in different sorts of situations. So most of us would say we need to compare a specific child's growth parameters to the World Health Organization's standards. And it helps if we have a little sense of statistics if we're going to talk about growth parameters. We typically measure growth, height and weight for instance, but then we compare it to other people's growth by talking about z-scores. A z-score, for our British-based colleagues, a z-score is a measure of the standard deviations that we are away from the mean. So we're used to this bell-shaped curve of how normal people would be for whatever the measure is, height or weight, and we talk about the standard deviation away from the mean. People that are two standard deviations from a mean are considered abnormal typically. More than three standard deviations or distances away from the mean would be cons considered severely abnormal. So when we talk about z-scores, a z-score is one standard deviation. So a z-score of minus three means three standard deviations minus below the mean. So when we're talking about severe malnutrition, we're talking about a child whose growth parameters are more than three standard deviations below the mean that would be considered normal. So the next slide simplifies the diagnosis for us of severe acute malnutrition. The regular severe wasting kind we would get with the weight for height. Point in time measurements of the weight with height and if we're less than three standard deviations or farther than three standard deviations below the mean, meaning a z-score of less than negative three, 
that counts for a diagnosis of severe acute malnutrition. One other way we could look for a child between five months, sorry, between six months and five years of age uh, would be to measure the mid upper arm circumference. The mid upper arm circumference of less than 11 and a half centimeters would count as a diagnosis for severe malnutrition. Even children with kwashiorkor, with lots of peripheral edema, usually do not have edema of their upper arms, so the upper arm can be used. So the main key to diagnosing severe acute malnutrition is finding a weight for height z-score below negative three. Um, we could do it by looking at the mid-upper arm circumference, um, and if there's edema, that might uh, that might uh, relate to calling it kwashiorkor as a clinical sign, and it might relate to the weight not being quite as slow, quite as low as it was before. So the key to diagnosing malnutrition means we can measure a height and weight typically, we can look at a table that we should have available in hospitals, and then we can see if a child is below minus three for a z-score. Hopefully this isn't too complicated, but any of you listening, and watching this presentation. If you're having questions along the way, feel free to write them down, and we're looking forward to answering questions and responding to comments uh, when we eventually get to the end of all this. But we want to focus mostly on treatment. How do we treat a child with severe acute malnutrition? The treatment, certainly we could say, feed the child, but we've already agreed, I think, that malnutrition is not just a lack of food, but it's related to metabolic and biochemical derangements, so we need more than just food. So typically we will admit the child to a hospital. Um, this graph shows, the table shows, if the child doesn't have a good appetite, has any medical complications of illness, then we would treat them as an inpatient in facility-based care. In most situations, any child with a Z-score height for weight of less of Z score, sorry, a Z score of weight for height of less than negative three would qualify for inpatient care. In some settings, you might have a good nutritional rehabilitation program in a community based setting where, if there was a good appetite with no medical complication, you might be able to treat in the community. But usually, with the weight for height less than minus three for a Z score, we would go ahead and admit to a hospital. The interventions then would involve feeding and some other treatments. Um, the other treatments, we have abbreviations that we'll get used to um, for the different types of formula and the different types of food. The key to help children survive and the solution to my challenge for decades in dealing with malnutrition is what we call the World Health Organization 10-step program. The World Health Organization came up with these 10 steps which have revolutionized the care of malnutrition. If I had known this when I was living in Congo, if I would have known about the 10 steps as I was traveling in the subsequent decade or so, many more children would have recovered rather than passing away. And the key to doing the 10 steps is to think about what is it that's metabolically wrong that's endangering the child's life. So the 10 steps shown on this slide, even with a little British spelling for us, first hypoglycemia, followed by hypothermia, dehydration, and electrolytes, and then infection. In fact, we see that the first five of these 10 steps aren't even related to food. The child has malnutrition, but the treatment starts by focusing on the metabolic derangements of blood sugar, temperature control, fluid and salt status, um, and the risk for infection. This is what saves the lives of children. This table also shows with arrows when we focus on this, and in our initial day or two, we're focusing mostly on the blood sugar, the body temperature, and the fluid status. Even as we start a little bit of feeding and we're involved with the child, we're focusing first on the metabolic derangements. So we're focusing initially on this. There are good data, there is good evidence to support the use of this 10-step program. A study in South Africa looked before and after using the 10-step program and they halved the mortality in their center. 
Uh, they dropped the mortality of severe acute malnutrition from 46% to 21%. A similar study around the same time, a bit over a decade ago in Malawi, had similar results but even more dramatic, dropping their mortality with severe acute malnutrition from 55% down to about 16%. Following the 10 steps works. So we start the 10 steps focusing on hypoglycemia, hypothermia, and dehydration. As we do this, we're going to be making sure that we give the child adequate sugar in an environment that's adequately warm and that we give an adequate amount of fluids. Dehydration is a key, but sometimes we can be confused as we look at a dehydrated child. Tenting of the skin, where you squeeze on the skin and then hold the skin up and see the wrinkle is in this next slide. Tenting of the skin, we know, can be a sign of dehydration. But tenting of the skin also occurs when a child does not have subcutaneous fat. Um, so we have to make sure that we're accurately seeing dehydration by looking at more than just skin tenting when we're assessing the child. And then we need to realize for the dehydrated child that we need to give fluids. Now, we would give the fluids preferentially orally, and we would use a low-sodium oral solution. Uh, we've said that their sodium concentrations are high. This is not just a food problem, but it's a metabolic problem with severe acute malnutrition. So we use a special formula with a low sodium level. And the World Health Organization and UNICEF have made that formula available in much of the world called Resomol, Rehydration Solution for Malnourished Children, where we can have packets to prepare that. We limit intravenous fluids for the shocky children. The children that are severely malnourished with shock might get intravenous fluids, but usually only 10 or 15 milliliters per kilogram over an hour or two. Children that are metabolically imbalanced with severe acute malnutrition are at risk of dying from overhydration. And we've mentioned that their hearts are often not working well. So we have to be careful that we don't overhydrate uh, intravenously and we focus on the oral or the nasogastric use of Resimol. We want to make sure we're giving appropriate electrolytes, and so Resomol has been made with the appropriate electrolyte concentrations, and we make sure that we're giving them appropriate salts without adding too much sodium to their foods, leading to other problems. One of the next of the 10 steps relates to infection, and we need to be aware that malnourished children are at an increased risk of bacteremia serious bacterial infection with bacterial germs floating around their bodies. A study in Gambia looked at severe acute malnutrition and found that on presentation, 15% of them were bacteremic. They had germs such as salmonella, usually not the typhoid, but a different kind, or streptomonia or E. coli. So when we're seeing a child that's sick with malnutrition, we have to think about bacteremia as well. That gives us a few different areas to think about anti-infective treatment for severely malnourished children. We typically start treatment with a broad-spectrum antibiotic, usually ampicillin and penicillin, or ampicillin and gentamicin, sorry, either ampicillin or penicillin along with gentamicin if they're very sick. If they're only mildly sick and not so ill, we could consider an oral antibiotic but usually the intravenous antibiotics are better effective. Besides the risk for bacteremia, we have to realize that there are risk of parasite infections. We'll think about anti-helminthic work and anti-malarial treatment, but usually we're going to start those after we've started the initial couple days of the 10-step program. And we always have to think about vaccination. It's sad to see a child recovering from malnutrition only to get measles from another child that's been sick nearby. So we have to make sure that we're vaccinating. So as we work through the first five steps of blood sugar, fluids, and electrolytes, and temperature control, then we get into the infection areas, and then finally we get into dealing with the actual nutritional pieces of it. And of course, we're starting this early, but we want to make sure we're thinking clearly about the life-saving treatments of the first five steps. When we get to malnutri uh, malnutrition treatment with micronutrients, 
the easiest and most effective thing to do is to get some of the prepackaged feeding programs. And again, World Health Organization and UNICEF usually supply these. If we don't have the special formulas and resomol fluids, uh, then we'll be thinking about making sure we give adequate amounts of vitamin A as special dosing, giving zinc for the first week and a half or two, and then continuing with folic acid and other vitamins in a multivitamin formulation. There's some risk of infection being increased if we give iron early. So we usually hold off on the iron until a few days into treatment when the appetite has returned and the acute infections seem to be resolving. And then we focus on actual food with cautious early feeding. We don't want too much lactose giving an osmotic diarrhea. We don't want to overwhelm their kidneys and liver with too much protein. We want them to be able to absorb this, and we don't want to overstretch a shrunken stomach, which means we're going to go with cautious early feeding. The formula that we use is called F75, pictured here as one example. F75 is a formula with 75 calories per 100 milliliters of formula. So this is the initial treatment formula for the first few days of treatment as the child is adjusting and as we're realizing their metabolic derangements. The child I mentioned that had a meal and then looked at the mother and died probably had electrolyte imbalances that killed the child because we had been trying to give normal food without being aware of all the metabolic problems and without giving appropriate feedings along the way. So as we start our cautious early feeding, we will adjust the volumes uh, and it gradually increase the volumes as the child's stomach can handle it. For the first two days, we're going to probably be giving two hourly feedings at about 11 milliliters per kilogram per feeding. We'll work up on that as you see in this table here. Um, this is effective and it works for our cautious early feedings to get the child going. Many malnourished children are too weak and they're unable to do this by mouth, so we place a nasogastric tube and we provide feedings directly through the tube into the stomach. Children do well and we've cut mortality rates remarkably by attending to these early cautious feedings and then we can transition to F100, a formula with 100 calories per 100 milliliters. Uh, and so we start the F100 formula. Um, the volumes we would continue the same way um, and we usually make this transition when the appetite is back. The children with kwashiorkor are slower than the children with marasmus to get their return of appetite. And we use return of appetite as the hallmark to think about transitioning the feedings to this fuller calorie formula. Um, and then we can provide what we might call ketchup feeding with our 100 calorie per 100 milliliter formula and then using RUTFs, ready to use therapeutic foods. There are brand names for these that are also provided by World Health Organization and UNICEF, like Nutty Butter, as we see in this slide, or Plumpy Nut. They're usually peanut butter-based formulas um, that have the appropriate calories in a concentrated way for children when they're onto their normal feedings to give supplemental therapeutic foods. This next table shows the composition of F75, the starter formula, and F100, the ketchup regrowth formula. And you can see there are differences in the sugars and the caloric content um, and what's made up with, with the electrolytes in them. Um, it's possible to find recipes and to make your own F75 and F100. There are re recipes readily available in the World Health Organization literature. Um, and even if you have access to the slides, of some little recipe details at the end of this presentation. Uh, but in fact, the most effective way is to have it already prepared where you have all the details added with the right electrolyte balance. So that's our summary of treatment um, of severe acute malnutrition. 
Um, and as we're treating um, severe malnutrition, we've gone through the 10 steps, focusing on blood sugar, temperature control, and fluid status with appropriate electrolytes initially, and then focusing progressively with time on infections, and then that cautious and catch-up feeding. Along the way, this is a person. This is not just malnutrition. We need to provide sensory stimulation for the child, some loving support, and getting the child ready to return to home. We consider that we're about ready for dismissal. When the appetite is good, the child's gaining about 10 grams per kilogram per day, um, so that they we're growing some. Uh, excuse me, 10 grams per day, and when the z-score is back up to the negative 2 range. We want to see growth happening. We want to see the weight catching up. So we'd like to see the z-score no longer at below minus 3, but up into that negative or minus 2 range. If the child had quashiorcor, the edema should be resolved before they leave the inpatient treatment. They should have all their acute illnesses treated. They will have completed their antibiotics. And we need to have appropriate outpatient follow-up. It's a real challenge if we don't have a good community-based program because the child will be returning to the setting they came from. And we want to make sure that in that setting, the child will be able to get appropriate nutrition so as not to fall again into the challenge of severe acute malnutrition. So we need to provide that good inpatient care, but then have them ready to go home and continue with their success. Does it work? Yes. Here's an example of one child that came in severely malnourished, sunken cheeks, not much weight on the body at all, got nasogastric feedings, and then within weeks was able to go home as a plumpy, happy child and to continue with good follow-up to keep getting care. So what we've just done is summarized the overall treatment of severe acute malnutrition with some details about what to do. And I am guessing that many of you joining us on this session today have some experiences that you could share about what works and what doesn't work, or perhaps there are some questions along the way as well. So I'm happy to open this up for discussion. And I think some of you have been able to type things in. Tom is trying to talk to us, but I'm not sure if it's just me or if others are having trouble hearing Tom as well. But feel free to be sending your comments and questions online. Uh, Dr. Fisher, you hear me now? There we go. Yes, Tom, good to hear you. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, I, I had muted my mic, so if I coughed during your presentation, I didn't want to have that interfere. Uh, being an epidemiologist, one of my primary uh, you know, uh, concerns comes in the realm of infectious disease. And I noticed uh, in your presentation that the treatment uh, uh, you know, with severe mal uh, acute malnutrition, SAM, uh, that that was listed as number five. So. It has been your experience, uh, this is a question, uh, it has been your experience that restoring the child to health helps them better tolerate uh, treatment for infection or, you know, or that restoring them to a, a degree of where they can accept nutrition uh, is more important than, uh, you know, than, than getting to the, you know, the disease, particular disease that they may have. I'd be interested in your comments on that. Yeah, great comment and question, and in fact, I would say yes to the either-or question. Mm -hmm. um, as we look at the arrows we had on those tables of the timing of the 10 steps, in fact, infection is starting at the very beginning. So we're mm -hmm. starting to deal with infection at the very beginning of our concern with the 10 steps. Um, but there is a timing piece that matters. So initially, it's bacteremia with serious bacterial infection that can kill these severely malnourished children. So we start with broad-spectrum antibiotics to treat bacterial infection at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Parasite infections would be a concern, so if there's fever in a malarial area, we would start malaria treatment at the beginning as well. 
um, but some things we're going to wait a little bit on. So we often won't start giving the medicine for intestinal parasites, and we often won't start giving iron supplementation until several days into recovery from malnutrition. It's those several days later that the child can better handle the iron and can then better combat the infections. There are some early epidemiologic data suggesting that early treatment with iron increased the risk of fatal parasite infections. Mm -hmm. So that's why we often delay the iron supplement for a couple of days. Um, so yes, the child needs to have nutrition to fight infection, but along the way we need to treat infection, and that's why we generously give broad-spectrum antibiotics from the very beginning. Okay, well, good. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, and my one primary, you know, concern is, you know, a child dies, uh, you know, and uh, I know these statistics are on the way of, of going down or improving, uh, but there's a child dies every four seconds out here in the world, and I don't think, you know, we who are in the more prosperous countries realize that the impact that that has, and, and I know malnutrition contributes heavily to that. My wife and I had the opportunity in 1992 to go to Somalia and work with Somali refugees. And I had often wondered why I, you know, God had chosen to send an epidemiologist on that trip. Uh, but as it turned out, we were set down in the middle of you know, a, an area of, of severe malnutrition. Uh, there were 250,000 refugees in the camps we were serving. But we were all set down in the middle of a raging malaria epidemic in the middle of the desert. So it, it became a real challenge for me to find out what was going on, how that was going on. And, uh, but it, the thing that impressed me the most uh, is, is your, your area of, of expertise. And that is seeing eight, nine, and 10 year old kids coming in uh, who look like a uh, stature no more than five or six year old kids from the United States as far as their height was concerned. But seeing them with, you know, uh, tiny, tiny uh, arms and limbs and, and you know, and then to, to be in, in, in addition attacked by malaria. Uh, and and I, I have done finger sticks looking for the malaria parasite when, uh, you know, what came out of the end of the finger with that stick was a pink liquid and not blood. And, and so, uh, you know, I thank you for your work. I thank you for your interest in, in children. And, and uh, I would encourage anybody else who's out there with questions that you might have, uh, you know, enter those in the chat box. Uh, your presentation was very clear, Dr. Fisher. Uh, and uh, I really appreciate your taking the time to be with us. Uh, you know, it was interesting to me uh, when you were talking about protein, energy, malnutrition, uh, you know, the difference between the wasting and the edema, quasi core and marasmus, uh, and, and you're seeing what that was. And you call the wasting a normal response and the edema, um, you know, a maladaptation. Could you go into that just a little more for us? Yeah, I want to make another little plug for your other previous comment, too, if I can. Um, and indeed, it takes a village, a team, to be able to deal with malnutrition. We need the epidemiologist pointing out to us what's going on. We need the biochemist to educate people like me to realize this is a metabolic problem as well as just a food supply problem. We need clinicians that will see these kids and care for them. But there are so many of them, we also need some logistically minded people that can set up programs. The program is very important to ensure that supplies of the appropriate solutions and formulas and foods get to the child and to make sure we have good structures and follow-up. So Tom, just to agree with you, yeah, it takes a team and we need epidemiologists and clinicians and basic sciences and organizers and everybody else. This is a team that we can all be involved with. Uh, in terms of the question you were actually asking, now I got carried away and I just blanked on what the question was because it was a okay. good one. Uh, the, you know, wasting an edema, wasting oh, yeah. you call normal um, edema you called maladaptation. Uh, would you go into that just a little more for us? Yeah, that's, that's a tough situation uh, because the marasmus you would expect if a child is poorly nourished and doesn't have enough of anything, there will be symmetric loss of protein and fat and problems like that. 
Kwashiorkor is kind of an asymmetric loss uh, because things are deranged in a bigger way. So it's maladaptive in the sense that instead of just losing the weight, the child also has lost balance of other situations. So protein concentrations go down in the blood, which then leads to the edema. So we have multiple problems going on that are making the child be even more out of balance. Typically, the child with marasmus is hungry and wants to eat. The child with kwashiorkor doesn't care about eating. So part of the underlying question will be why. What is it that triggers one child that doesn't get enough good quality food to have marasmus and another one to get kwashiorkor? There are some data suggesting that toxins or other factors along with food um, can trigger kids to have liver changes, which then are going to lead to kwashiorkor being the outcome. Aflatoxins, contaminating nuts and other grains and some vegetables, especially in West Africa, have been linked to kwashiorkor. So a child that doesn't get enough food will become malnourished usually with marasmus, but if there's another toxin or some other unknown factor, that might trigger this maladaptive response where the liver reacts differently, the body reacts differently, protein levels drop, electrolytes are more perturbed, and then the child has all those other changes with skin changes and hair changes and the other things. So it's a more maladaptive or irregular response, sometimes triggered by other things like toxins on the food, and sometimes we don't know why it is that one tri child is triggered to kwashiorkor while another one just gets marasmus along the way. Okay. Um, one of my other observations while I was there uh, was that uh, we saw a, what, a lot of what would be the wasting of the marasmus, of course. But in, I had t taken a picture of two very particularly beautiful young ladies, uh, I would say, you know, 11, 12 years old, sisters, uh, daughters of a chieftain. Uh, at the time, I was fairly naive about uh, the effects of malnutrition and, and thought, you know, that they looked nice and, you know, fully rounded out and healthy and, and that they, you know, they are the chief's daughters, so he was getting food to them. But in retrospect, when you go back and look at those pictures, you would see, you know, the thinning of the hair and the blonding of, of the hair and, and definite signs of malnutrition. And they were the ones... Uh, that were, you know, that had this, the edema, uh, you know, the quasi ochor And what you had just, what you just said is just very revealing. And the fact that uh, it's very likely that they were getting grains or other things that had uh, the various toxins and uh, were causing, or triggering the response that you, that you mentioned. So thank you for that. Yeah, it brings out the other good point. Um, that not always is just, just poverty related. There are other social factors that may relate to children not getting good food or the right amount of food, and sometimes there are other political factors that change structures, and in your situation, a child that had resources but maybe was getting contaminated food. Um, it also brings up the point that the treatment of malnutrition and even the diagnosis is tougher in the very young children in the first six months of life, and then sometimes later on even. But the principles are true and the principles work. And lives are being saved because we're thinking about this in a more methodical, 10-step sort of way. We seem to have lost Dr. Tom's audio again. Um, Dr. Phil, I'll read you this um, note from Cindy Utley. Um, she's um, one of our folks here at Samaritan's Purse. Uh, she thanks you for your presentation. And alert diagnosis of safe um, treatment of SAM is vital. Also important is training for moms on infant and young child feeding. Um, IYCF, as well as exclusive breastfeeding during the first six months of life, go a long way to prevent malnutrition. Um, do you have any comments you know, related, I guess, specifically to maternal child health? Yes, Cindy, thank you very much for the good comment. 
Um, interestingly, the child I showed at the end um, that went from very emaciated to looking rather plumpy and healthy was a twin. And it was a situation where that child had been deprived, sadly, of some of the normal nutrition because the family was overwhelmed with two children at the time. Certainly better than treating malnutrition would be to prevent malnutrition. And prevention comes with appropriate breastfeeding in the first six months of life with the appropriate weaning or complementary foods after that. Um, so Cindy, yes, thank you, amen, exclamation points, I agree completely. We need to be nourishing children well. Interestingly, the word kwashiorkor comes from a Ghanaian tribal language and literally, I'm told, means the illness that comes to the previous child when a new child is born. And that's because children around age two would develop kwashiorkor in Ghana when there was a new child in the, ch the subsequent child, oh, sorry, the first child, the two-year-old, was no longer getting mom's milk and good food because the family was distracted, was busy with the new baby. So Cindy, yes, absolutely, I agree. We need to be preventing. We need to have appropriate breastfeeding, appropriate complementary foods after the first six months of life, and that would save all this trouble in the first place. Thanks for that comment. Okay. Yeah, I think my audio is back. Um, I'm having a little trouble with this set today. Uh, I'll have to switch to another one. So thank you, Dr. Fisher, uh, for that. Thank you, Cindy, for your question. Uh, if there's any other questions out there, we still have a few minutes, uh, you know, that we can include this. So uh, certainly would, uh, you know, uh, welcome any in or input or questions you might have. If we don't have any other, uh, Dr. Fisher, we want to thank you today for your very uh, clear and very helpful presentation. Uh, and, uh, we, you know, we pray that you continue to work. And if you don't mind, I would like to pray uh, for for you right now and for, for the group uh, that is listening. Uh, Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for your son, Jesus, and we know that without him that we couldn't be here, but we're here as brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, Lord, to bring to you uh, our praises, uh, that you motivate the people like Dr. Fisher, uh, Lord, to lend not only his studies, but his expertise and his time, and even his family, Lord, to go with him as he reaches out to touch the less fortunate around this world. Oh Lord, we pray that you motivate others to join in and to follow his footsteps. And we thank you for those who are doing so in the field right now. Cindy Utley, I know, is, is one of those. And so we ask your blessing on her today, too. Oh Lord, be with us uh, as we go through our week. Uh, Lord, call us to where the need is the greatest. And Lord, uh, we pray that you give us the means and the health to respond. And we pray, give you that praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, Dr. Fisher, I want to thank you, and uh, you know, for your presentation. I don't uh, see anything else, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this morning. So, thank you for joining us, and thank you for you know for being part of of the uh, of the presentation. This will thank you for the presentation this morning, and uh, we look forward to uh, reading uh, some of your contributions as you go into into the future on this. And uh, good luck up there at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Uh, it is springtime up there now. I hope you guys don't get your spring floods. We've certainly got them here in Texas. So. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Thanks to all of you that joined us. And keep up the good work as you're dealing with malnutrition and lots of other important issues around the world. Okay, thanks. I want to remind uh, our group that is listening uh, that CME credit is available for this session. Uh, the forms and instructions are in your email, and we will be sending a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this presentation. Uh, if you're not on our email list, uh, there's a link at the bottom of the video you know, uh, that you will find to go ahead and sign up. And uh, we're in the process. Uh, I'm formed here that we're in the process of launching a new website for the International Health Forum, and it will be at health.samaritan.org. This site will house all of our webinars and resources and more. And uh, it's in the soft launch stage at this point in time, which means that we invite you to go in and check it out uh, and uh, send in your feedback. Uh, that would certainly be encouraged and welcome. Our next webinar will be on Wednesday, July 13th. That will be Dr. San Tom Sanderson. And he'll be talking about complex humanitarian emergencies. And uh, we hope to see you back then. So thank you very much. Uh, 
Julie Tanaka is saying thank you, Dr. Fisher, for an excellent presentation, and from Sydney Utley saying thank you. So, uh, if you're still with us or still listening, uh, we, you know, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, uh, for that, and uh, thank you thank all you for all. joining in.